Okay, we're going to start off this next session, the nutrient management session, uh, soil fertility and nutrient management. Uh, pleased to have our new soil fertility uh, research and teaching specialist with us today uh, presenting. Dr. Phillips came to us in August. Uh, his previous position was in Morocco, that is not in southeast Oklahoma. So Morocco, he worked with APNI, the A African Plant Nutrition Institute. Uh, prior to that, he was with IPNI, so International Plant Nutrition Institute, which if you've had the CCA exam and you took the international exam, you had the study guide, it was often provided by the IPNI work network. The old, old folks who remember PPI, uh, Phosphate and Potash Institute. Prior to that, Dr. Phillips was at Virginia Tech as a soil fertility specialist out on the eastern shore working in painter, getting to do some grow crops and tomatoes. And prior to that, he was at Oklahoma State for his PhD. He is a Bill Ron alumnus, a technician. And so it's kind of fun to have him on campus as he was a Bill Ron technician. Uh, Dr. Thompson, the department head, was a Bill Ron technician. And I'm a Bill Ron technician. So there's a little bit of a, a little bit of continuity in there. But I'm happy to have Dr. Phillips up. He's going to talk about the mainstay of the long-term trials at Oklahoma State, which is the Magruder trials, and looking at manure availability and as we cycle with that. So Dr. Phillips? Seems like the more gray hair you get, the longer your introduction becomes. So, well, thank you, Brian. Brian mentioned I'd been with IPNI for several years before coming here at Oklahoma State. And I've been trying to get on this winter crops program for several years because I'd heard about the reception and I expected to find some drink tickets stuffed in my badge somewhere, Brian. So I guess it's just an open bar at the open bar at the Bronx tonight. All right. All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. As Brian mentioned, I am a new soil fertility specialist, but I'm not new to Oklahoma or Oklahoma State University. So I'm very happy to be back home with you. I am a native of Oklahoma, as, as Brian mentioned, been gone for several years. And so I'm very fortunate to be back on the team here at Oklahoma State University. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys this afternoon. I want to um, uh, draw your attention to Raiden Sherry. This is actually his work. I'll be presenting it. It's a, a paper he's been working on, putting together for Brian. He's finishing up his PhD with Brian this spring. Uh, Raiden got a, a better gig this week. He's up at the Indiana CCA School, and as he's trying to get a job, that's a better bean on the, on the CV than this one, unfortunately. No offense, Dr. Arnell. But I'll be presenting Raiden's work. Uh, manure in availability, as Brian mentioned this off our Magruder plot study, which I'll, I'll say a little bit more as we get into it. Our average nutrient content in Oklahoma, according to Swaffle data, is about 121125 average analysis. This is on beef manure. Now, just you're, I'm sure you're aware, but it just behooves me to remind you that all manures are not created equal. There's different nutrient contents in poultry, beef, swine, dairy effluent. There, it depends on whether it's, whether it's wet, dry, but the recs that we give out of Swaffle are based on as-is nutrient content. And this is total nutrient amount. And you also remember that in manure we have organic and inorganic fractions of nutrients. And so we have different recommendations on the percentage of that organic fraction that will become plant available during the growing season. And that's what we're going to focus our talk here on today. Uh, we talk about val added values of organic nutrient sources. One of the big ones is or organic matter contribution. As we increase our organic matter levels in soils, it increases our soil structure, moisture retention, microbial activity. All the things that we're hearing a lot about these days when we talk about soil health parameters. What makes a good healthy soil? Well, a lot of these attributes of improved organic matter, as well as uh, aggregate stability. A final point I'll make about nutrient or manure as a nutrient source is a sustainability issue in terms of nutrient cycling. We generate about 10 million tons a year of manure in Oklahoma that's got to go somewhere. It's going on the land somewhere, and so it's our responsibility to make appropriate guidelines 
available to you as end users of these products to make sure that we're doing this in the most sustainable and environmentally conscious way. Uh, here's some data that came out of uh, northern U.S. and Canada. It's a, it's a few years old. They looked at 11 years of manure addition. And this is just to put some data to these facts I was telling you earlier. That as you can see, as we increase the annual rate of manure, we increase percent organic matter. And you can see from those organic matter levels, this is definitely not Oklahoma soils we're talking about. This, this study was actually out of Vermont. Uh, pH increases. They say P increase in terms of percent. Now this P and K buildup is an issue because of the unbalanced nature. You remember the, the nutrients I said were 1.21, 1.25? That's not the ratio of nutrients needed by most of the crops we're growing. And so when we apply manure on a nitrogen basis, we're inevitably over applying P and K relative to crop demand. And so that's why they're seeing these buildups. And then I mentioned the aggregate stability all ties into pore space, increased aeration, increased nutrient water infiltration rates, just general overall productivity of the soil. We also had a paper come out of Oklahoma State here a few years ago. You'll see Dr. D. Brian Arnell is one of the co-authors on here. Uh, some of Bill Ron's students a few years ago. I think this was, let's see, this was a 2007 publication. I just want to draw your attention to this last row of numbers here. You remember that the Magruder plots were started in 1892. We've harvested wheat off these plots every year since then. And so this paper went down through, this was published in seven, so it went down from 1892 to 2002. And that bottom column shows the organic matter lost percentage-wise over those years. As you can see the check, this started at three and a half percent organic matter and the check has gone down to 2.4 percent. Most of that's lost probably in the first few years once we broke out those prairies, the mineralization and nitrogen began in a, a very rapid decomposition of the organic matter in the soil. So we're down to the 2.4 where we were in 02 and as you can see the manure had only gone down 1.85 percent. So the least reduction in organic matter was in that manure treated plot. Mention the, uh, mention the uh, Magruder plots. You can see here, these are out on the agronomy farm. You can see that black square. Is this green? You see the black square here. That's where they're located. This is western. So a, as you ride out on western, heading west out of town, you're welcome any time to pull in and look at these plots. They're set up out there, marked with bright, big orange posts. They're kind of right over close. You can see them. You can see those posts coming up. I think that's, was that University? Is that, that's, oh, okay, this is Western, this is 51. That's right. Thank you, Brian, I've turned around. So that's, that's where those plots are located. So you're welcome to ride out there anytime. They were established in 1892 in a different location. They used to be on campus and they moved uh, later on. So they started just as a check plot, basically, where they wanted to see how long can we sustainably produce wheat without any inputs. And so in 1892, that's what the experiment was. And then in 1899, they split that original experimental area and started the manure treatment as we know it today. In 1930, it expanded to 10 treatments, which was a combination of N, N and P, NPK, NPK and lime superimposed on both the check and the manure plots. And in 47, they were going to put some new buildings on campus. And so they had to relocate the Magruder plots out to their current location on the farm. They did this by removing the topsoil and the subsoil separately, went out to the new location, established the subsoil, then put the topsoil back on it. You know, in terms of our claim to fame as one of the longest running fertility experiments in the world, this is where we tend to not get as much love as our colleagues with the Moro plots and the Sanborn plots, Rothamsted. You know, they have, they have these, these symposiums at meetings and things and bring in all of the long-term fertility plots, but for some reason, Magruder doesn't get invited. And so we asked them this year, they had one of these at the ASA, we said, hey, how come we don't get to play? 
Well, you move the plots. Okay, so we've only been growing continuous wheat at that exact spot since 47. So, okay, still pretty good sitting. We ended up only moving six treatments at the time, and that's the treatment structure we still have today, where you can see we have the manure, which we apply every four years, currently at a rate of 240 pounds of N per acre, the check, an O30 O phosphorus only treatment, a 6030O nitrogen and phosphorus a treatment, a 603030NPK, and then a 603030NPK plus lime. Lime's only been applied three times since 1892. Whenever the pH falls below 5.5, we lime it back up. The last one was in 2014. Before that, I think it was in the 50s and then maybe in the 20s before that. So that's, that's as frequently as we change that treatment. And then we, uh, we, in 1968, we raised the N-rate. It used to be 120, and then 30 pounds on the annual treatments. We changed that to 240 to keep up with increasing yield potentials and just changing practices to keep it more relevant within the wheat producing area that it's representing. We've changed sources a few times over the years. 2004 was the final in-source change where we've gone from uh, sodium nitrate to ammonium nitrate to finally urea in 04. We also changed, I think around 67, we changed, uh, 67, 68, we changed from OSP to TSP. But the, the sources that we're using now that you see on the bottom of the treatment structure there are what we've been using ever since. We changed varieties from time to time. We try to keep it on about a four to five year cycle with the variety changes. But other than that, that's, that's, the tr that's the experiment that we're currently working with. There was another paper out of Bill's group in 2019 where they looked at the comparison of nitrogen uptake in the grain comparing the manure and the NPK lime treatment. They looked at data from uh, 1990 to 2015. And the general take-home findings were that there was a significantly lower grain in uptake in the manured plots. It was a difference of 10, almost 11 pounds of N per acre. But there was no significant difference in grain yield. There was five and a half bushel difference, but that didn't turn out to be statistically significant the way they analyze these data. And they found no difference in accumulated nitrogen in the soil under either the NPKL or the manure treatment. Well, what was interesting about these data is that we apply the manure with the intention of it providing four years worth of nitrogen. And then on the night, on the inorganic end treatments, we apply those annually. So they're both getting 240 pounds of N over a four year cycle. In year one, we'd be looking at 240 pounds of N versus 60 pounds of N. So you would think that they would not be different or the manure plots would have an even higher in uptake, that there'd be some advantage to that additional in because you know 60 pounds is really light in terms of nitrogen required for the yield potential we have. So you would think intuitively that the manure plot ought to have more, especially in the first year of the cycle. So when we look at these are all first year after application differences. As you can see, they're not the same. We got one year there in 2000 where they're about the same, 96 they're pretty close, but most of the others there's a discernible difference. Less in uptake in that manure plot even though there's four times as much in we believe to be being applied there. And so this was the the impetus to really start to look at this are we actually getting the nitrogen we think we're getting? Well, what do we think we're getting? Well, our uh, fact sheet 2228 that's av available, our current guidelines indicate that, as I, as I mentioned, you see you gotta make sure you're looking at the right line. Feedlot manure, 50 to 70% of that total nitrogen should be available for the plant in the first year after application. And then the future availability, years two, three, and four, we would estimate that 10 to 20% of that total end will be made available. 
And so then we have another fact sheet that gets more into the management of specifically beef manure. It's 2250. And it says basically the same thing, that inavailability from feedlot manure will range from about 40 to 80 percent. But then there's a bit of a contradictory statement compared to the other fact sheet where it says that looking at inorganic and organic, about 50 percent should be available in year one, and then 15 percent and 6 percent in years two and three. So we need, we need to look at why we have these two different sources and figure out you know, what are the data, what are the differences. I haven't had time to answer that question, but that's a question I'm asking as well. Is it 50 to 70 and 10 to 20, 10 to 20, 10 to 20, or is it 50, 15, and 7? If we look at what other states around us are recommending, they seem to be more in line with this 25, 15, 7 recommendation, whereas we're still sitting there on our actual guidelines, 50 to 70, 10 to 20. So as you can see, we're not in line with our current guidelines compared to our neighboring states. And, and so the objective of, of this work, and Brian had another student that did it as part of the dissertation, but Raiden has really taken it and gone into a much more detailed statistical analysis of these Magruder data to try to figure out what's going on with the nitrogen. And so the objective of this work is to use these data to get a, a, a better estimate, at least figure out are we really, what's happening out here? Are we getting 50 to 70 or is it something else? And so the way we set this up was Magruder is an unreplicated trial, just by nature. When it was established in 1892, this was what we call the pre-Fisher era in statistics. We didn't have the knowledge of the power of replication and randomization that we follow in, in experimental design today. And so there are things we can do to get around this. In the case of a trial like the Magruder, where we have over 100 years of data, we can use, we can create replicates in time. And so what we've done is we've taken the four-year manure cycle and called that a replicate. And so every four years, and I only took the data from 68 because, again, you know, we get back into this nitpicking of the changing locations and the data. So I'm like, okay, let's just go 68. Nothing's changed since 68. So that, those are the data we're going with for this study. So that gives us... 56 years, it gives us 14 cycles, total of 56 years of data that we're looking at in this study. We've grouped them into four-year cycles. Another thing we do to add a little power to, to this test is we look at year both as a fixed and a random effect. Typically, year is always random when we're looking at in terms of effect on yield, or in this case, in mineralization from the manure, but it's fixed relative to the manure application cycle because year two is always year two removed from the application. Year one is always the next wheat planted, the next, that first wheat crop harvested after the manure application. And so we, we've constructed the data that way and we're only using the check, the manure, and the NPK lime treatment. The first thing we'll do is we'll look at in uptake, and the way we calculate that is in uptake is grain yield times percent in in the grain. Now, another thing with Magruder is over the years, we've collected different data sets depending on how we're using the data. If a student is doing, for example, in that uh, paper looking at from, I think it was 90 to 2015, they ran nitrogen content on the grain. They had those data. Over the years, we have different groups of data. So for this analysis, we've averaged all the data we have available, and it's 2.16%. And so we've just used that as a standard in concentration in the grain. This is an acceptable methodology. We have removal coefficients for all crops. NRCS uses them in the 590 for removal-based uh, allowable nutrient applications. So it, it's an acceptable standard operation here. And then we calculate 
fertilizer recovery, which is basically the in uptake in the fertilized plot, either the NPK lime or the manure, minus the in taken up in that check plot. And so now we've got an idea of the fertilizer derived nitrogen. Divide that by the amount applied, which in the case of in, of, of the inorganic in is 60 pounds every year. In the case of a manure, it's 240. And so every year we should have diminishing uptake percentages in the manure there, and it should be fairly stable in the inorganic source. And then we can use those numbers to calculate the N availability in the manure, which would be the N recovery in the manure divided by the N recovery, because we know that the nitrogen in that inorganic source is 100% plant available, but not 100% of it's going to end up in the plant. This is in use efficiency. We know this. And so we want to know, well, what is the number in this? It's going to be a little higher because our in rates are lower than optimum. And so let's see what that number is and then apply that same value to the manure. And so we know how much in was taken up by the manure. Let's see what percentage of that in terms of total that became available. And so our first set of results we'll look at here are the nitrogen uptake values. As you can see, both end sources significantly greater than the check in every year. The star indicates a significant difference comparing the manure and the NPK. And so no difference in the first year, as expected, but then a significant difference in years two, three, and four. The values pretty similar to what they saw in that earlier paper uh, looking at in uptake. Now using those numbers to calculate fertilizer in recovery, you see a much bigger difference between the two sources now. The average, there's no difference among sources on the different years. So in terms of the percent in recovered in the inorganic source, it's 44.8%. And you know, we're always understanding that we're probably around globally 33 to 40%, so at this about 45% makes sense in terms of the, the little bit lower end rate. So we're at 44% average, significantly higher than what we see we're recovering out of that manure in in any year of the study. So now let's calculate what does that mean in terms of nitrogen availability. Again now, this is in uptake in the manured plot, in uptake in the fertilized plot, the average fertilizer recovery in the inorganic plot applied to the in uptake. And so what we find is that we get about 23% estimated availability in year one, about 20% in year two, 16 in year three, and 14 in year four. In terms of differences, statistically, one and two are not different. Three and four are not different. One's different from three and four, and two's different from three and four. And so, this leads me to think that everything is lining up in terms of what we're seeing in the uptake with the published data, what we're seeing in terms of percent recovery with published data, and now our availability estimates are matching published data from our neighboring states, suggesting us that, you know, maybe we're not. These data suggest we're not getting 50 to 70 percent in year one. Well, let's look at year one across all 14 of the cycles we worked with. And you can see here a lot of annual variability. And this is not surprising. We see this when we look at yields across time, when we look at in response to in fertilizer across time. They're independent. They're not related. Some years we get a lot of yield with a very little in. Some years we, it takes a lot of in just to make a little yield. And so what we see is a lot of variability from year to year in year one availability but what's important to note is one time we got 50% out of availability. One other time we got about 47. But in terms of 50 to 70%, these data suggest we can confidently say we're not getting 50% out of that. Why? 
Maybe it has to do with the calibration data that was used. Maybe the original estimate of availability wasn't based on a fall application and a winter wheat crop, whereas now as we're getting later and later with our planting due to the crop rotations, you know, it may be middle of November before we put this out. And there's, there's not a lot. I thought maybe there might be something to do with weather on these data, so I went back and pulled all the mesonet data that I could looked at average temperatures in the fall and the spring, fall rain, spring rain throughout the growing season, and there's nothing there. there I, I can't really explain why we get 10% in one year and 50% in the other. Weather's not the, not the explanation. It's, it's a factor, but it's not the defining or explaining factor. So it's, it's a mystery. But these data clearly say the average is not 50, the average is 23. We look at the frequency distribution across those years. Again, you know, this is just another way to look at the same thing that, you know, 10 out of 14 cycles, we're in that 10 to 30 range. You know, kind of in line with what K-State and Nebraska are saying that we're in the 20 to 25 pounds available in the first year after application. Year, year two puzzles me a bit because uh, as I mentioned, there's no statistical difference between 23 and 20% availability. There is a difference in terms of what that means relative to actual in applied for yield, which we'll get to in a second. But we've still, uh, when we look at this frequency distribution, we've, it's hard to say that, yeah, it's 10 to 20 because we have still, you know, another seven that are getting 20 to 40. So I'm not sure what we say about year two at this point. This puzzles me a little bit. We've got to do some, do some thinking about that. So I'm not sure where we are in year two. I looked at the combination of year one and year two to see if when we have really low mineralization in year one, does, does year two end up higher? Again, I can't find a relationship there, but we're going to, we're going to keep, keep sniffing around on some of that. Years three and four, they seem to kind of fall in line with, with what we're saying, 10 to 20%. The majority of them are there. What we got to be careful with, though, is those, you know, those high frequency bars there in that 10 to 20, a lot of those are less than 15. So we're, 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 come, we're you know, if we get to the point where we need to revise these recommendations, we, we've got to do a little more work to, to fine tune this. But in general, we'd say we're, we're closer to what we're saying here anyway, at least in years three and four, in terms of the 10 to 20%. So going back here for this next part, what I do is because, you know, we've got some, some frequency uncertainties, we'll just go back and we'll just talk about these averages, 23, 20, 16, and 14. And so what's that mean in terms of the quantity of available in? So comparing these head to head in each year, we would have 60 pounds of available in in the, in the urea treatment. And then going across the years, that gives us 56, 49, 39, and 35 pounds of available in coming out of that manure. So, you know, that earlier paper says, well, they didn't find any difference. That five and a half bushel difference, which, by the way, was lower in the manure, was not statistically significant. But it may have been the way that they analyzed it, because when we look at it, we find significant differences in grain yield in years two, three, and four. No difference in year one, which we wouldn't expect. We're getting, you know, the, the availability is 60, 56, no difference in grain yield there. But in years two, three, and four, you know, we're looking at, you know, six to eight bushel differences. You know, and this is based on the idea that we should be getting enough in out of that manure to, to make yield. We would expect it to go down. As we see on that manure line, those are significantly different from year one. Years two, three, and four are different from year one in the manure. In, in the NPK, not different. That's the same. Those yields are the same every year statistically. In the manure, though, years two, three, and four are not different from each other, but they are significantly lower than year one. Now, we don't recommend putting out four years worth of manure to grow four wheat crops. You know, this is an experimental design issue, and so on the annual application, you wouldn't do that. 
But if we find ourselves in a situation where we're being regulated on applying these nutrient sources based on crop requirement, then we got to have a good number on the availability to make sure that we're not cutting ourselves short on yield potential with a bad nitrogen number. So to wrap, wrap this up, in uptake in plots receiving manure were 14% less across the manure application cycle compared to the urea. They found 20% in that other study, so, so we're in line. They were looking at a smaller subset. We've got a bigger set of data. As I mentioned, we got 56 years of, of data in this study. They had 25 in the other one. Uh, in availability over the four years of the cycle was 23, 20, 16, and 14 percent respectively for one, two, three, and four years after that manure application. Grain yield significantly reduced when we use manure in years two through four of the application cycle. Again, 6.7 compared to 5.5 in the earlier study. Ours was significant probably due to the, the different way we used year in the analysis. And that this analysis suggests that our current guidelines in Oklahoma are overestimating manure in availability one year after application. That's just these data. You know, I can't stand up here and say that, you know, we need to change the RECs, but I can say we need to look at the RECs, especially, I mean, what, what does this really mean to us in terms of a user of manure? Am I restricted, you know, as an end user? All I can find in Oklahoma, and again, I'm a little ignorant, on the, on the current legislation, but all I can find is a statute that seems to suggest we can apply on a nitrogen basis, and so, you know, does it matter? I don't know, but we'll get to a point where it will matter, and we gotta have the right number. So th there's enough here, and we've done this right, so there's enough here that suggests we need to take a look at this, and, and we will. So with that, that concludes my, my comments on that. You wanna, want me to take some questions, Brian? We've got some time. Got any questions about this? Again, this is, this is Raiden's work. He'll be writing this up and publishing this this spring, and that'll hopefully kind of give us the, the foundation we need to go forward. Yes, sir? We, we test it when we get it to the farm. When we get it next to the plots, when we do the, the nutrient analysis, and as soon as we get that, we put it out. Yes, sir? All, all I can speak about is the beef manure. I, I haven't looked at any other data. I mean, this, this is the long-term data we happen to have in the soil fertility program is, is, is on beef. So I, I don't have the data to say anything else. My experience with poultry litter uh, in other states is that, that those, that's a little more nitrogen coming off of there. You got a much bigger inorganic fraction if you keep it covered or you're bringing it straight out of the house and then incorporating it. So the manure number is always bigger with poultry compared to beef, but you know, I, I can't say with certainty what it would look like in Oklahoma. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, we incorporate the manure immediately. Yeah, all of ours is immediately incorporated, which, you know, leaching would, would be an issue for us. As that becomes mineralized, you know, it goes through nitrification and into nitrate. When we're putting 240 pounds of in out in the fall, if we've got a warm fall of warm wet that the conditions are right we could that 15 year study or 25 year study they didn't find any they looked at i can't remember the depth do you remember the depth that they that they okay yeah so we'd have we'd have to to look at cores on that but they didn't find any difference in accumulated in in whatever depth of profile and it may have just been been surface samples but yeah cer certainly certainly that nitrogen's going somewhere I mean, we're testing the manure. It's in there, but we're not getting it in the plant. So, yeah, it's, it's going somewhere. Oh, 
Oh, that definitely affect mineralization. But what, but what I'm saying, you know, looking at the weather, I, I couldn't find it with the with the data. You know, I had that would require uh, a more comprehensive evaluation under a little more controlled, replicated system. You know, it's you know we we can only do what we can do with these Magruder data because of the unreplicated, the one you know it's one shot per year. You know, it's like it's like deciding to use the average in concentration in the grain because you know I you give me a four percent. You know, was that a lab error? Was it, you know, where, you know, that grain, it's not 4%. I know that, but if that's the only number I got to go with, then I, I got to throw it out. So, you know, we're, we're a bit restricted in, in the things we can do with this data set, but it, it's good enough to at least point us in a direction, you know, where we can do a more robust evaluation of this and figure out what's going on with this manure in. Any other questions? Well, all right, appreciate it. All right, ne next speaker up will be Mr. Sam Aiken. So Sam is a California native. It is more comfortable with uh, rice and pintails than he is necessarily uh, wheat and sorghum, but Sam's been a part of our program. He started his master's with Dr. Ron right before he passed and then has stuck around for a PhD with me. Sam's going to give an update of a lot of different projects, basically summarizing three or four different projects, some that he's been a part of, uh, and just kind of walking through the, the latest in the, the winter wheat research from the program. Sam, come on. Too far away. I hope y'all don't hold it against me that I'm from California. Arnell had to just, Arnell had to just air out my dirty laundry on that one. But I've been here for a little while, and so I hope y'all accept it. Um, like he said, I'm gonna be talking about the latest um, winter wheat nitrogen management research that we've been doing here in the Precision, Precision Nutrient Management Research Group. Um, a lot of hard work putting into this. Um, anyways, here we go. Now, before we can get into talking about the trials, we really need to look at the 4R approach to, um, to nutrient management. The 4Rs, if you don't know, I'm sure most of us have heard it ad nauseum. Um, but the 4Rs are the right source applied at the correct time in the right place at the correct rate. And this will really be the, um, the basis to this presentation. So choosing the right source, what is the right source? Do we apply anhydrous? Do we apply urea? Are we going to, like in California, are we going to apply aqua? Um, and that was the basis of the question to this first trial that I'm going to be talking about in our nitrogen source trial. But before we can talk about that, we need to talk about two different products that were in this trial. Um, the first of which was Super U. Super U is a um, urea product coated in NBPT which is a urease inhibitor, as well as being coated in DCD. And the kind of the idea is, is that we're going to get this early coverage of the urease inhibitor, and then later on we got the coverage with the DCD with being the nitrification inhibitor. And then the other product that was in this nitrogen study was Anvil. Anvil is a combination of NBPT, again, our urease inhibitor, as well as duramide. And duramide really is a more robust version of the NBBT. It's going to last a little longer, and it's kind of similar to what we're seeing in Super U. We got this early coverage, and then we're getting a little bit of coverage later. So the nitrogen source study. Um, this study was conducted in 21 through 23. It's a random complete block design study consisting of 12 treatments and a control replicated four different times. Now this Experiment was conducted over in six different lo experimental locations over the years, everywhere from Alva to Chickasha. So we got a wide variety of environments throughout the years. And this created, um, resulted in eight site years of data. It should be noted that our nitrogen rate was at 60 pounds of N to the acre. Um, this was by design. We expected at these low rates that we we're going to see these differences in our sources. Um, we'll see them really pop out um, was the kind of the idea. 
Um, the two nitrogen, main nitrogen sources that were used in this um, study was UAN and urea. And we also had two additives, the ANVIL and SuperU. ANVIL was added to the UAN, and then again, as I said earlier, SuperU was a urea coated product. And if you look, looking at the treatment structure, you can see that we've got three um, planting, or not planting dates, excuse me, application dates with the way things work out. Three turned into four, and that ended up being a pre-plant, a January application, an application from February to March, and an application from March to April. So with that, let's get into the meat and potatoes of the study. So this is a graph of all the, um, of all the data put together. Uh, and what we're seeing here is we're not seeing any statistical differences in our, or in our product additive and our original product. SuperU and Urea are not statistically different when we look at them as a whole. And UAN and UAN plus Avonvil are similar. But the thing to note here is we, this is all of our data put together. So um, all locations. But we did have site-specific um, differences. And this is where I'll get into next. And Alva 21, um, this location, we were able to maximize our yield with SuperU in the no November application. So we're getting that uh, durability and that longevity in our urea using that. Um, and then in Chickasha, we see a different, something a little different. We're not maximizing with SuperU this time. We're maximizing with our urea in March here. Um, and so, again, site, envir different environments, different years, might res or sh or the data is showing that we can have differences and are maximizing. I'm sure as you saw in that first one, we, there a, was a big difference in between uh, urea and <clears throat> UAN. And this is kind of just really showing that here. Um, in these years, urea was able to maximize yield, or we were able to maximize yield using urea products. Now, if we think about it and remember these past few years, these years were extremely dry, correct? And <clears throat> when we're applying a liquid, if we don't get our, um, a little bit of rain or get a rain in on our um, UAN, our liquid treatments, we're going to be tying up quite a bit of um, nitrogen in the residue, so we're getting losses in that. And so hopefully, and um, Dr. Arnell has informed us that we are continuing this since we have a different year. We're finally getting this a good rain. So I'm told this is good rain out this year. And so we would hope to expect to see in these coming years or in this year, we see maybe a difference in maybe liquid when it finally gets rained in, we'll, we'll um, compete. Now, as I was saying earlier, there's four timings in this application. Um, it wasn't just a source study. We had the January, December, or pre-plant, or January, or February, and March application, and our March to April application. Um, our results from this study um, kind of confirm with other studies that our March and our February to March our timing is going to be when we are going to maximize both yield and um, grain protein. And then in, um, sit kind of similarly to the site specific looking, um, we also had timing specific where our product and our product additive was going to shine a little bit better in different situations and different timings. As you can see in November, SuperU is where we're able to maximize our, our grain yield. But once we get into later, into March, where we are actually able to maximize just using uh, urea. So we've talked about the right source, but when is the correct time to apply? And this is really a loaded question because it depends on a variety of variables and not ju um, just environment. So environment is a big one. I mean, are we, as I was saying earlier, are we going to get weather to rain in our UAN? Can we get into the field this year? at this time because of weather? Or is it going to be dry for the next two weeks? Roast stage is a big one too. 
is my wheat or my plant big enough to where I can, maybe it's small enough to where I can wait a little longer, or maybe I need to get my uh, top dress in now. And then of course, labor availability. Are we gonna have help here in two weeks to apply it, or do we need to apply it now when we can? And similarly with equipment availability, is that tractor gonna be available to go out and apply? <clears throat> so is it really worth the wait to wait? 20% um, of nitrogen has only been taken up by the uh, jointing stage, and then 80% is being taken up by flowering stage. So we have got this window of time where we're taking up a lot of nitrogen, we can, if we can sneak in there and get a top dress, we can get a, a good amount of nitrogen to our crop. And with that, I would like to start walking into the Gallagher and Green Hammer study. Uh, but before we can really talk about it, we kind of have to talk about um, this study done by Dr. Silva, which was really a study where we posed the que uh, question that <clears throat> started the Gallagher and Green Hammer study. Dr. Silva tested four different varieties in a fertilized and non-fertilized environment. And what she saw is grain yield wise, we're not seeing any statistically differences in neither the fertilized or non-fertilized um, environments. But where we start to see the differences is in when we looking at when we start looking at grain protein. Double stop and green hammer, which you can see in this top here, are high protein varieties. And they're high protein varieties in both environments. And as well, uh, we don't see a change or a fluctuation in, either, in, in these different environments. And uh, our Gallagher and, green, uh, and Iba are doing a similar thing what they were when we were in our fertilized uh, applications. And so this proposed the question, well, why? Why are these varieties um, producing lower proteins in either, either situation, and why are these high protein varieties producing uh, high protein in these situations? And so here she went and mapped out the nitrogen uptake curves of these varieties through um, jointing all the way to maturity. And what she found, and what was found is that these low protein varieties the uptake curve is a little bit slower, a little bit lower than the other variety, the high protein varieties. And so it's just taking a little bit longer to get, take, take an uptake of the uh, nitrogen source. And we can see that in here in the whole plant and as well as in the stem. So the Gallagher and Green Hammer studies. The ex this experiment was looking at the varying response to nitrogen management regimes. We're looking at late versus, uh, early versus late, and also looking at split applications. This study was in a random complete block design consisting of 12 treatments plus a check replicated four times. There were two uh, N rates in this study. We had our 90 pounds of N applied, and that made up about nine of our treatments. And we also had our or 140 pounds of N to the acre, and that made up only three of our treatments. Nitrogen applied in, in this study was ammonia sulfate, 3400, and it was applied by hand. Um, and this experiment was done at two experimental locations. We had our Perkins location, located on the Cimarron Valley Research Station, and as well as our Lake Carl Blackwell location, or our Perry location. Um, this, that uh, location was just just outside of Perry. And then um, both of these ver uh, variety blocks were planted in blocks right next to each other. So getting into the data. So what we found is when we were looking at grain yield, we're not, we're seeing a benefit to this delaying of the nitrogen. And we can see this really well in this 90 top dress but we're not seeing any, a whole lot of benefit to splitting up our application, where it, like we are seeing the benefit to delaying that nitrogen as a whole. We saw that here in the 22-21 in the uh, Perry location. We also saw it in the 21-22 uh, Perkins location as well, where the 90 pounds applied as top dress instead as a pre-plant is out producing or producing higher average yields than our pre-plant was. So 
we had oops, we had two locations. I only put up one on this one because the Perry location we didn't see any statistical differences. But in the Perkins location in 22 and 23, we do see a linear trend in increasing um, grain yield as we're delaying these um, nitrogen applications. And I should mention, I, per, I apologize, I did forget, we had that pre-plant application, which is our first number, and we had an early top dress, which is our middle number, and then we had a late top dress. That late top dress was triggered by a jointing stage. When our crop finally finished, met jointing is when we went out there and did that late top dress application. But like I said, we, saw, we see this linear trend in this year and this location of increasing grain yield at, in this higher uh, um, nitrogen rate. So grain nitrogen con concentration. We see a little bit of similarities. Um, when we were looking at the 90 application, we we're not seeing a whole lot differences when we're delaying it but what we are seeing is as we're delaying that nitrogen or the majority of that nitrogen later and later we're getting an increase in our grain protein and we can see that really well when we're looking at our 45 0 45 split compared to our 30 30 30 split and we can see that we're not getting a whole any more increased benefit to that extra tractor or that extra application the extra time that we're taking to go apply um, and again, in the 30060 and comparing it to its um, twin, the 3060, we are, the, as we're delaying that majority of the nitrogen, we are getting an increase of um, green, um, green nitrogen concentration. And we see a similar trend here in the Perkins location. As we're delaying that nitrogen, we're seeing an increase in, um, yeah, an in, in increase. And 22, 23, again, I, I, we talked about how we didn't see at the Perry location, we didn't see a, a significant difference between treatments, but we did see that linear trend in grain yield at the Perkins location, and we see it here again in the grain nitrogen concentration at the Perkins location. Now, the Gallery Green Hammer wasn't our only timing application um, study. We also had our protein progression study where we asked ourselves if we delay this timing, can we increase our protein? Um, this study was a random complete block design, complete with 11 treatments and a check, replicated four times <clears throat> over six locations. Total nitrogen applied here was 120 pounds of nitrogen. The nitrogen source was UAN. We also had ammonia or source, or not ammonia source, excuse me, a um, a sulfur source, which was ammonia sulfate. That's, I had a typo, and I was freaking out about it earlier, but um, ammonia sulfate is 120026, not 120256. It'd be a little amazing. Um, this, um, this study had four application timings. We had our pre-plant, our top dress, our flag leaf application, as well as an anthesis application. So getting into the meat and potatoes of this study, as we can see here, we're not seeing a whole lot of statistical difference between our treatments as long as we're applying to sufficiency. When we're at 100% nitrogen is when we're seeing everything. And this is just for grain yield. And so you might be thinking, well, what does this matter? We didn't see any differences, right? That this matters a lot because we're showing that this top dress in application um, during these times, we're not negatively impacting grain yield when, we're, uh, when we do this application. Moving on to grain nitrogen concentration, we are starting to see differences in our grain nitrogen concentration as we are delaying this timing further and further. And we actually maximize our grain nitrogen concentration when we apply an emphesis here. Now, what this is telling us, what the data is telling us, is that we can increase our grain nitrogen concentration or our grain, or our grain protein without negatively impacting our grain yields. So. Okay, so we talked about the right source, we talked about the right timing, but now we got to talk about the right placement, or how do we apply, apply it? Does it really matter? And that was the basis of our, our um, anthes uh, application and anthesis um, study that we did from 2019 through 22. 
Um, again, this was another random complete block design consisting of 12 treatments and a control replicated four times over the course of six years and on three experimental locations. Total nitrogen applied in this was uh, uh, 90 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, we had 60 up front and 90 um, as a top dress. Again, we're at these lower uh, application rates where we would expect to see the differences be more magnified. Um, nitrogen sources were UAN and liquid AMS, or liquid, um, liquid urea, excuse me. Um, we had three different nozzle types uh, application. We had our flat fan nozzle, we had a 3D nozzle, and a twin air nozzle. And the kind of the idea behind that is, is we're increasing our coverage area with our different nozzles. We also had two droplet sizes here, which were coarse and fine. So grain protein, when we start looking at grain protein, um, again, um, just to touch on base on this, when we were looking at our grain yields, we didn't see any statistical differences between our grain yields, between the way we applied them. Um, similarly, what we were seeing in the protein progression study. Um, but what we are seeing is we're starting to maximize or increase our grain nitrogen content when we're starting to um, increase our coverage area. So we got that 3D nozzle with a, with a coarse droplet size is with UAN is showing that we're or able to increase the majority, or excuse me. Another thing to note is that UAN uh, was able to produce higher grain nitrogen concentrations than our liquid urea. And we can see that really well when we compare our treatments, our flat plan treatments to our, our to each other and our 3D treatments to each other and as well as our twin air to each other. Again, this is relative protein to a check, so the relative increase to our not applying uh, nitrogen and we are really seeing here, especially in our 3D applications, that we are getting this increase in ni uh, nitrogen concentration by increasing our um, coverage. and so showing that we can, if we increase the coverage, we can increase the assimilation of nitrogen in the plant. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for bearing with me. I am, was extremely nervous, so I apologize for going fast. Is there any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I didn't have that data. That, this study was actually done before. Hmm? It's, it's 24%. 24, okay. Yeah, everything was applied at the same rate. Yes, sir. Uh, no till. A, a note on that urea versus UAN had the no till in every location. Any other questions? Great job for the first time. Yeah, so that first urea versus UAN, if you think about it, that UAN, especially the fault applied, every location had really good ground coverage. We're going into heavy straw residue, heavy sorghum residue. So you put liquid UAN on the ground and it doesn't rain for 100 days, it kind of gets tied up. And so, so that's what that work showed too. All right, so if we get uh, Arnell summer crops. Mm. All right. This will be the last one. So as soon as I'm done here, we'll pop up the QR code. We'll leave it up for a while. And all you poster judges will come up also and grab your things. The grad students will go over to their poster session and we'll commence judging. I would uh, advise the attendees to also hit the poster session. I know most of you go out and find other things, but go over there and visit and uh, poke and prod at these grad students. So, so with this, just wanted to provide an update, not knowing how long I would have to visit with you guys. So just an update of some of the summer crop work we've been doing. Uh, I would, I'll put this as a uh, you know, prelude, is summer crops in 21 and 22 and part of 23 were not pleasant. So we, we have uh, some data and uh, not some data. All right, so summaries uh, of this. So uh, we're now on our second year of running biologicals. Two years of sorghum, two years of cotton, both funded by commodities. 
Uh, has anybody seen this uh, infographic on the bottom over there before? Show of hands, who's seen this? This is mixing bowl. Liz has, all right, the, the, all right, we got three. Okay, pivot folks have. That's not products available, that's companies that have products. There's more than one, okay? So there's more than one. And I want to give you some other stuff in here along this line. This is what, what we're looking at is that the, the, the amount of products on the marketplace of stuff. I've, I've talked to some really good friends who are national agronomists that were early on told, you find a product for a portfolio or you find another job. So it was, you know, kind of a black and white scenario for, for these larger corps that didn't have uh, products on their portfolio, portfolio that they better find one. Uh, I just throw this, this is kind of full, this is a, a cool ag research location, it's Stratus Ag Research, they, they survey customers, and I just like to throw these up because it's uh, the attitude of the service provider. So basically your attitude, which, well, Alan, I know your attitude most of the time, but you know, we, we've got the attitude of our service providers. So this is the attitude towards biologicals. 20% are say it's valuable, 32 are curious and open, 26 are unconvinced but might consider 20% basically are reluctant uh, until they have evidence and 4% are basically hell knows. That's, that's the overall survey of this group. And this is the fun part if we go next. Sold by region in the U.S. Northeast, Corn Belt, Corn Belt, all tend to have the higher sales and great plants. Notice... And my friend, Wes has not made, is Wes back in here? My friend from Mississippi, I've shown this before. So notice the regions that are most reluctant to, to sell the, the biologicals. Southern, Central, and Southwest. Maybe those that might get hotter or drier and just are a little bit more uh, grumpy as farmers might go. You know, you're not the 250 corn boys that just throw the seed out there and magically you have 250 bushel corn. You know, so, so those are the regions that the, 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 at least the acceptance has been lower. Sold, and this is what was funny. I saw this, so y'all, I don't know if you can see it, but the top is Utricia, then it goes Quick Roots, you're in, uh, in Vita, Toggle, Black Label, Jump, Proven, Black Earth, Humic, then Source. The number one is probably the one that has some of the least amount of data, Utricia. Who sells you, Tricia, though? You all know who sells you, Tricia. Who sells you, Tricia? Anybody know? Corteva Forever. Do you think there's any tie with the company that sells a product and it being able to be number one? Maybe. How about the one that's been on the marketplace since Jason Lawler was, was an undergrad, which is Black Label Zinc? I think that's been around at least 15, if not 20 or 25 years, it's there just kind of hanging on, right? It, it's, it's a dominant. But this is just the products that are the best sellers and just goes through the list there. And then the, uh, the performance, this is how people feel about them. The legend, if it's green, they feel it's great. If it's brown, they don't know or they don't want to do it. And so the organic acids, the humix, the fulvix, those are the ones that have the most feel good within at least the crop. They have the most confidence in those. Then it goes to the seaweed extracts, which does hurt my heart a little bit, but the seaweed extracts and the botanicals. But there, there's, some, there's, reason, there's reason and rationale. Beneficial bacteria and fungi are next, and then the nitrogen fixing is 13%. Then we get to the amino acids, and effectively nobody thinks they're excellent. And a lot of people aren't really sure. This just gives you kind of the breakdown of where the industry is seeing the placement of a lot of these products and the comfort level in, in, in selling them. All right, so let's get back to that. So, so now into the data that, that comes from us. This was the 22 season. I've shown you this last year. Just know that 22 sorghum, it wasn't worth anything. If, I, if I'm only cutting 40 bu uh, bushel sorghum and I've done everything in my power to keep it alive, we don't expect much to happen. So no, no benefits in 22. We do have 22 cotton had some stuff, but basically there's your sorghum data. Just know that it's not worth looking at. And so here's your cotton data. Note, when I do things, I have a, make a nitrogen ramp, 40, 60, 80, 100, and everything's compared at 40 pounds. So all products get 40 pounds, which is the first, is that same as the first bar. And what you should note is there's no difference between 40 and 80 as far as pounds of nitrogen. 
So there was no nitrogen response. So if I've got a nitrogen creating product, I'm not going to see a nitrogen response because there was not a nitrogen response. The only responses we get in these environments would be one that would make the plants healthier or get more water or something not nitrogen. And so in those two years in the cotton work, we saw one that, that neutrino unlock tend to bump, but there was nothing statistical anywhere in the cotton. So moving to year three, year two, we're back at it again. Uh, in 23, we had sorghum. We ran uh, the, the products on the sorghum uh, checkoff was indigo, uh, new leaf, bio, uh, BW, which is Environoc 401, Valent, Wilbur, Acido, Exotic, and the Corteva Utricia, a whole range of stuff. Basically, the kids are a pit car, pit NASA, NASCAR pit crew because we're dropping bottles off constantly. We're switching out every about five minutes, and we do a clean out. So to put a new bottle on, we got to run alcohol twice, run water, and then blow out, then put the product, then we run alcohol, then we run water, and we blow out the product. So it's a make sure we don't have contamination. In the sorghum crop, oh, I, on the cotton side, we did a zero. This was a multi-state project, which I'll touch later, and we had fewer. The reason we had fewer is, one, we wanted the products to be nationwide, and they had to be labeled in cotton. Not every product is labeled in cotton. Sorghum tissue. Uh, what we found is that none of the treatments impacted nutrient level except for the fertility treatments. If I added more nitrogen, I could increase the nutrient concentration uh, specifically of uh, sulfur, iron, zinc, and copper. They were unaffected by the other treatments, so more nitrogen, more of those. Sorghum yields, we did get at one of our four locations that we got to pr uh, survive, and f every one ton's about 15 bushels, so we're really talking about 45 bushel again. We're last sorghum crop for me was. I'm not a good summer crop farmer, folks. I, I am suffering greatly on making anything pay, but we had a nitrogen response, uh, but none of the treatments, what we're looking at is everything beyond the 60. I needed this, the numbers, the letters in those bars, and I don't know if you can see them, needed to be different than that 60 pound, and none of them were. The only ones different were the 100 and 120 pound rate. So at least statistically, there was no yield benefit. Our cotton work, this is one, every one of those uh, yellow pins, we had cotton trials, everybody did the same thing. All soils were sent to the NC State lab, all tissue tests were sent to my lab. All the biologicals were sent and tested by another lab to get pure live strain. We're still getting, I mean, heck, we were just picking at the end of last month. So we're just now getting uh, the gin and sample sent off and trying to get turnout, trying to get quality. Um, but the, the, the group was to be uniform evaluation of the same products. We've got 824 tissue samples in, about 500 have been run. I don't have the data, just let you know we're, we're banging that out by Beltwide. If you're going to Beltwide in January, I'll have that data. But we did the tissue analysis. Lint yield. This just is an estimated because we got raw seed cotton weight and I estimated turnout. Uh, I'll tell you the Fort Cobb turnout, we had some bowl locks, so our turnout estimate is more like a 27%. Lofton and Brenna will tell you that we, it, it took two or three passes to get, get it opened up at Fort Cobb. We just didn't get uh, OPREC, though, was beautiful. We had beautiful, so our turnout set at 33%. We have at Fort Cobb for the first time in history, Lawless. I've been at Fort Cobb for six years. The first time I've had nitrogen response on that sandy soil. For some reason, the whole cotton after peanut with like 300 pounds of nitrogen on the cotton crop led to residual. Got a nice uh, nitrogen response. Uh, the micro surge, it was a seed plant and that's what happens when you forget to put the tube on the vacuum planter. When you drop, you know, you're switching seed out, you drop that seed off and you put, got to put that vacuum tube on. If that vacuum tube is not on the, the planter, it doesn't plant. And so ignore those yields. But we go back, everything's at 40 pounds, the zero is a check, everything's at 40. Uh, we've got one at Fort Cobb that had a tenth of a bale better, uh, which was the, the uh, Invita. It's not significant. And then if we go to the High Plains, the OPREC, the 40 pound rate cut 5.5 bale, and it was beautiful cotton. I don't know if it's 5.5. Five. Yeah, John. Six. 
60 on sorghum and 40 on cotton. And so this is the 40 as a baseline and everything's across the board. And we see that even at OPREC, we don't have a good end response, right? So if I don't have a good end response, I'm looking for other things and just didn't have a whole lot out there. So nitrogen at OPREC, that's that Panhandle Research Station, it just didn't have a whole lot of need for nitrogen this year. And we're talking, think about it, five bell on 40 pounds of N. That's all it really took to max out. We went a bell up by another 40 pounds. So it was a good year, but just not sanding out in that environment. In rate work, kind of moving through this so we can move along. Been really looking at the end rate for cotton uh, for the last several years, and I just want to hit up on this. Um, you know, I don't know how much of this data, but we look at, we got Fort Cobb, we got OPREC, and we have Altus. Altus is, you know, uh, furrow irrigated. Well, would you call Altus furrow irrigated? Anybody down in Altus district, when's the last time you irrigated at Altus? Huh? It's been a couple years, right? So, not in the last three years. So, we, we haven't had water in that district, and honestly, the cotton hasn't been great, so we don't have a lot of that. I will tell you, when we were in Altus and had good yields and had irrigation, a top dress cotton application didn't work well when you didn't irrigate it in or a side dress. But if we looked at Fort Cobb, if we looked at OPREC when we had irrigation over the top, those side dress treatments actually did quite well. Our turnout was improved and our quality was improved by delaying some of that nitrogen, especially following some heavier uh, fertility crops. So 22 work, I'm just gonna go to 23. Again at Fort Cobb, that first number is pre-plant rate. The zero means it was zero pre-40. At Fort Cobb, really, I could do as much with just delaying to that side dress application, which was, was about pinhead square, a little bit before pinhead square, which this, this is a deep sandy soil, which you would think is nitrogen needing, but the system has a fair amount of residual buildup at depth. And so if you can root down deep, you've probably got access to some nitrate reserves. And so I think we get a benefit, especially at Fort Cobb, and you're gonna see some stuff here in a second, about creating, you want the first couple of weeks you're gonna to see to be a little bit deficient on nitrogen to get the roots start seeking. And then once you plug into that deep profile, you can really start taking advantage of the nutrients and water down there uh, once you get that root to seeking. Corn cotton rotation, kind of just sharing with you guys what we're doing. Uh, the high plains, I know we don't have a lot, but the whole issue of trying to grow cotton crop after corn crop when you're fertilizing for 270, 300 bushel corn, and even worse off if you're cotton, the high plains is already a challenge because it's not like you got a long season. You need to get it up, you got to get those bowls made, and you better be getting it shut down before the first freeze. So anything that lengthens that growth period will cause you some problems. So we're looking at end management in corn cotton rotation. Uh, if we look at the first year, let's move to this. Um, we had some really good response. The black bars on this, on that one side, is a corn yield. So in 2021, 300 bushel corn yield across the board. Zero pounds to 300 pounds. But what you see is that if you had the orange fall on that is the cotton. So if I'm really low on my pre, I get a boost from that 50 pounds coming in at, at Penhead Square. But if I'm fertilizing at what the farmer recommended rate would be, which is about 250 pounds of in or up, and I come in with that extra 50 at Pinhead, I actually short my crop. It's just too much. There's enough residual from a fully fertilized corn crop to really take care of that cotton crop. And so unless we're dialing in our end management on corn, we basically can back off on that cotton crop and set back unless something's just really amazing. Um, and, and we tended to hurt ourselves more when we fertilized. This year, we didn't have much of an end response. I still cut, uh, the, the corn grain was 150 bushel across the board uh, in 22. So what we do is we plant corn, put fertility on it, then plant cotton the next year. Uh, I forgot to blow these graphs up because I did this last night at like 11. So the take home on this message was from last year, we needed about 40 pounds of nitrogen on that cotton crop, and that's about it. We grew uh, 200, 2200 pounds of lint, which is four and a half bell of cotton in the high plains, and really need about 40 to 50 pounds of nitrogen. 
And on the high end, what we saw, the, the yields look good, but we're going to get our quality back and we're going to find that, that as that end goes up, we're going to start losing some, some value because we had more green, we had more small bowl, we're going to have, have more issues on that. Some of the more fun stuff we're doing. So this is Michaela Smith's dissertation. There's some old work out of China, and I've handed this around, and we want to test in Oklahoma with, with cultivars grown in Oklahoma. So we put 32 cultivars in a growth chamber, all cotton cultivars, and you basically have pots that have no nitrogen and all the other nutrients and pots that have enough nitrogen to grow a crop and all the other nutrients. And wanted to see what would happen, because the research indicated that if you stress a cotton crop with nitrogen, it will make more root. Think about this. Do you want cotton or corn, do you want to plant it and keep getting like a quarter inch of rain every two days as soon as you put that corn seed in the ground, just keep these light rains? Or do you want it to get a good seed, get going down and go a little bit drier, get a big rain? That, those light rains tend to make the roots shallow because why would it explore when it's got all it needs in the top quarter inch, half inch, right? So the same thought process is for nitrogen. If I'm nitrogen poor, can I make the root explore the soil profile more? And what happens? Uh, we're in the middle of the second run right now. This picture's from the first. It takes a little bit to scan them in, but she, uh, Michaela ran three rates. If you look the full end, medium end, and low end, basically uh, across the data, and we'll show the data in a second, there's about six or seven cultivars that I could triple the root length by having low nitrogen for the first two to three weeks of growth. And so we look at that, and there's some that was inversely affected too. So what we're finding, this bar is, if it's up on one side, so if it's up on this side of the room, that means the root and shoot ratio was improved, or the root length, go to that root length one, the root length was longer under the low nitrogen. If you're on the other side, the, the really small bar, that means the root length was shorter under low nitrogen. So there was some definite genetic differences. Some wanted the nitrogen to make roots. You guys follow? And some were really triggered by a deficiency and just really rocketed it off. And were honestly pretty freaking lazy. The ones that have that big tail just got super lazy if there was enough nitrogen there. And so what we're, we're looking at is like, we might be needing to be careful on how we manage. If I'm following a corn crop with cotton, I don't want it, that lazy rooted cotton crop. I want one that, especially one on the tail end there that will still explore the soil even though I got enough nitrogen. Does that make sense? So we might need to be tailoring their cultivars even by their root exploration. If I'm following uh, wheat and maybe, maybe dry land situation, I want that one that's gonna take advantage of not having nitrate and start growing and make my adjustments. If I got a stand coming up and everything looks good, then I'm gonna uh, blow on the nitrogen because the, the system's starting to look good. One of my last projects we're gonna talk about. Uh, this is a fun one. So this is a forward looking project and I invite uh, anybody in this crowd to help us out. So this is the spatial drivers of potassium response. In fact, this is a young uh, Dr. Aiken's uh, dissertation project. Where's, where's Samuel at? Did he already run away? He ran away, okay. You aren't, you aren't collapsed back there. So he talked wheat, but he's actually working spatial drivers of potassium. I'm gonna guess in here, has anybody ever had a soil test potassium above, above 250 and seen a response to potassium? Okay. Has anybody had a low soil test and seen a lack of response? Yeah, so I've got soil test of 25 that I could put all the K on, the crop never responds. I've had soil test of 400, I put K on, the crop responds. So what the hell, right? And so, so it's probabilistic, so we're trying to dig in, and it's a really fun study. Well, the K response will go through here. We're, what we're doing is putting out strips in your fields. If you apply K, give me a strip where you don't. There's enough people that don't apply K that I go, go out there and put out K strips. So this last year, we had strips, we had about three miles of strips, Sam, across the state, Ponca down to, uh, down southeast to Tulsa on soybean fields. And if I put a K strip out on you and we don't see that K strip and we walk away, but the deal is if the K strip should have shown up and it doesn't, we're gonna come in and look, try to describe why it didn't. If the K strip shows up and it varies from one spot to the other, we're probably gonna come in and harvest. And what we do, 
is we bring in our little oomph loop as our Massey uh, Ferguson combines and we go up and back and every 50 foot we stop and collect yield with and without. So we're getting the spatial change of yield. Then we follow back really quickly and every one of those 50 foot segments are, are crews following up with a 15 or a six inch soil sample composite in that 50 foot. So we're getting the soil test that you guys would get for a normal soil test. Then we follow that up with two deep cores. So we pull two Gideon probe tubes in the same spot in the middle, uh, right by each other. One we're gonna break up and basically, I think it's two inch segments going down to about three foot. And the other, we look at soil horizons. Where's the A? Where's the B? Is there a BT horizon? Anybody that's a soil scientist is like in the, you know, I'm saying those words, but we're looking at the soil horizons. How, how much A do we have? When does the B happen? And down on the river soils, the kids that hadn't seen it before got to see on those rivers, the alluvials, where they had A, B, buried A, B, another buried A. And so they got to see all those layers in there in the clay layers to say, okay, is that a driver? We're also running the Varus sled. We're running a electromagnetic sled, which is uh, the topsoil mapper. And we're also on that Gideon's because we go up with the Gideon's pulling the cores and we come back, the cool thing has a pentrometer on it. So this, you push it down the soil and it measures resistance. At the same time it's measuring impact resistance, it's measuring EC and OM every centimeter going down to three foot deep. So we're looking at the soil as a 3D view. Instead of 2D and a chemical view to six inches, we want to look three foot deep and say, what's driving the response or lack of response to potassium? If we can identify those drivers, then we holler at people like Wes Lowe and Randy Taylor and John Long and say, this is a sensor we need you to build for us. Potassium, I think it might have to do something with potential rooting zone. Do I have a, a compaction layer? Do I have something re preventing my roots from exploring the soil and getting the K I need? Who knows, but, but this is the, the fun thing that we're digging into, the fun part of our research program. Uh, Dr. Phillips is a big part of behind this when we start talking about this. We've got another similar project in wheat that we're working on. So both Steve and I like this spatial stuff. We kind of really like the spatial change. And so we're both digging into this area. Really just wanted to give kind of an update of the, the progress and the works that we're doing in the precision nutrient management realm when it comes to summer crop. Uh, the real big thing that we're looking at is the spatial drivers and trying to basically improve variable rate management and create some sensors, kind of move that technology forward. Uh, besides that, anybody have any questions for me? Oh, oh. Potash, yeah, so the strips, we go out there with a, a barber spreader uh, of 0060, putting down about 150 pounds of product. So we're putting like 75 to 100 pounds of uh, potassium chloride, or potassium as potassium chloride. Well, we'd, we'd look in that in the soil samples because we would absolutely dig into that. And some of our sands, we could potentially say it's a chloride and we'd dig into that as we kind of fine tune that. I mean, we can go with potassium nitrate or, you know, the, the potassium sources that don't have something else to confound things uh, is a little bit tougher to get a hold of. Liz, are you gonna help me with that? Pure K source? Okay. Joe? Mm-hmm. So, so the question is, Texas has already dropped their from 40 to 30 for the first bell for in-rate wrecks on their cotton and moved the second bell to 35. I wanted to go to 30 pounds 10 years ago when me and uh, Randy Bowman dropped it from 50 to 40. I think we had enough data to go to 30, but we were both scared and were told that that's too far. But yeah, I think we could, we could go down on that, especially that first bell. We could probably reduce that pretty easily down to 30. And like I said, you're, you're working with Dr. Lewis, who has a ton of really good uptake work and looking at end use. Uh, 